and a Christian. All of these qualities that were described to Dorothy Dudley in her epitaph. So let's start by looking at what does it take to be a housewife in colonial New England. Now, by tradition, or by English tradition, a woman's environment was the family dwelling in the yard or yards that surrounded it. And the exact composition of her set of her setting depended on the occupation and, and economic status of her husband. And what's interesting is it didn't really matter if a woman lived in the countryside or in a more urban setting. Uh, her realm was pretty much the same, the house, the household. And the household would extend from the kitchen uh, to the cellars and the pantry, the brew house, the milk house, out into the gardens, the hen house, possibly an orchard. And what we're going to see is besides just the immediate family living in the household, we, you might also see servants. Now, in New England, there was slavery, although it, there wasn't as many slaves in colonial New England as in, say, a place like colonial Virginia, but people did own slaves. For example, Abigail Adams's father, uh, Reverend Smith, owned two slaves. And so there might be slaves in the household. There might also be white servants. And again, these aren't going to be indentured servants, but what they'll probably be is neighbors' children. Uh, many people had more children than they could actually really support. So oftentimes older children, uh, say teenagers, would go and live with another family and act as a servant. But despite the fact that families had servants, whether enslaved or not, the girls growing up within these homes and the wives themselves still had to labor. And they still had to cook and they had to still clean. And that's because running a household in colonial New England was a lot of work. Uh, one of the most basic skills that a woman had to uh, do in to run a household was she had to tend the fire. And that meant that summer, winter, day, and night, a woman had to make sure that there were always a few uh, brands smoldering in the fireplace, ready to stir at any moment so that you could cook or keep the household warm. Now, 17th century fireplaces uh, were not conceived as enclosed spaces for a single fire, but had to be accessible work surfaces where several fires could be uh, worked at the same time. And that's because cooking was done over the fire. And if you look at this image, you can see over here um, a woman using a skillet in the fireplace. If we switch images real quick, again, this is a, a photo of a 17th century uh, kitchen. You can see over here, we've got a pot, there would be a fire built right here, and a spigot right here. And so the job of a housewife would be to simultaneously manage the fires and the cooking. So you would be working this fire, working this fire, you'd have to raise and lower the pot as need be to get to the correct temperature. Uh, you would have to figure out how to um, cook over an open fire. If any of you have ever been camping and tried to uh, cook hot dogs over an open fire, you know it's incredibly difficult. So imagine cooking every meal your family would ever consume over an open fire. It's a huge amount of work. In addition to cooking, women had to be skilled manufacturers, hardworking agriculturists, and resourceful traders. Women, especially women on farms, had to process milk into cheese and butter. And if we look at this image back here, we have a woman uh, making butter. In addition to making butter, she also was responsible for slaughtering pigs and turning the meat into sausage and bacon. In the fall, she would be responsible for helping to pick apples and turning those apples into cider. She would also have to make bread. And then there was also other elements of manufacturing that would go on in the household. For example, spinning. Many women would have to spin their own thread and possibly weave it to make cloth. And they would also have to make their own candles in order to have light. This image shows many women working together. Uh, most likely you've got the main mother, it's a, maybe a couple daughters and a servant, all while making sure that these small children, uh, which would be in many households, there's lots of children running around at any given time, keeping an eye on them and making sure that they're not hurt. Let's say not run into the fire, for example. Now, women who lived in towns like Salem, Massachusetts, 
they might find that they spent their days engaged in trade rather than manufacturing or working with agriculture, and that it would be trade that would dominate um, what dominate uh, their time in order to obtain what they need in order to uh, prepare meals. In colonial New England, most food went directly from the processor to the producer or to the consumer. So that meant if you were living in town and you wanted to buy flour instead of making it yourself, um, you would buy your flour directly from the mill, or you might buy your bread directly from the bakery. And many New England towns didn't have retail centers, and that meant you may find yourself walking all over in town, engaging in several transactions in order to get the ingredients you needed for, for your night's dinner. In such a setting, trading for food, because you'd be walking all over town in order to get you know, you would get sausage from the butcher, you would get bread from the baker, you would buy your butter from somebody else. Because you're walking all over town and engaging in multiple transactions, you might actually um, use the same amount of energy to trade for your dinner as you would to make it yourself. And since cash was scarce, these transitions were done on credit and, uh, oftentimes revolved petty haggling. So it took a lot of work for these women to make sure that the households had the supplies that they needed in order to continue to function. Now, colonial women were by definition basically domestic. There are instances in which a woman might find herself having to act more publicly and to take public responsibilities. Now, there were three basic assumptions um, about the way a colonial family was governed. The first assumption was that the husband was supreme in the external affairs of the family. He was the head of the household. He was um, the one who had both the right and the responsibility to present the family to the outside world and to be in charge of all dealings. Now, the second assumption was, although the husband was the one in charge of making all the decisions, he should incorporate his wife's opinion, opinions and interests into his decision, although he by no means had to. But the final assumption was that should fate or circumstance prevent the husband from fulfilling his role, the wife could stand in his place. Under the right conditions, she could double as a husband, basically be his deputy, and that she had the responsibility to assist in the economic affairs of her husband. And so you see, ambitious men in early America were often involved in many things at the same time. They might be involved in both farming and running a mill, or cutting timber and fishing. And while these husbands were away dealing with these various enterprises, women would remain close to the home. And they were often at the communication centers of these diverse operations. And so that gave them the responsibility for conveying directions, pacifying creditors, and perhaps even making some decisions over labor. Now, on a day-to-day -day business, this might be a rather simple matter. If your husband's gone for, say, a, three days, that might you know, just entail remembering to send a servant to repair a breach in the dam after he's done in the field, or knowing that it's time to return an ox that you had borrowed from a neighbor. But during prolonged absences, um, women had to become involved in more weighty matters. For example, Abigail Adams her, uh, married John Adams in 1764. And from the beginning of their marriage, his job, first as a traveling circuit, church, church, sorry, a circuit judge, and finally as a politician, took him away from their small farm in Braintree, Massachusetts, a lot. He was gone a huge amount of their marriage. And that meant that the responsibility of running the farm fell to her. And so as his deputy husband, she bought land, she managed the family farm, and she oversaw the farm's tenants and employees. And it's not just women like Abigail Adams who are married to extraordinary men like John Adams who have to do this, everyday women, especially in coastal towns, uh, wives of fishermen often had to supervise the spring planting as well as the collections of debts that were owed to their husbands. And this